In certain Christian traditions, there's been an emphasis on giving something up for Lent. And people usually choose to give up some type of creature comfort or to maybe work on an addiction or something that they struggle with. Well, our Lenten sermon series will focus on things that we should all give up. Certain attitudes or practices that are very common to us and yet hinder our relationship with God and our relationship with others. The first practice we're going to focus on giving up this Lenten season is something I'm really, really good at, and that is worry. Our scripture lesson actually comes today from Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. Hear God's word. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let us pray. Indeed, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would add your understanding to this word, so that indeed you might speak to our hearts today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in 1932, there was a German physicist, Werner Heisenberg, who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of quantum mechanics. Now, for centuries, physicists had believed that the universe was measurable, that it was predictable, that it was absolute. Heisenberg shook up the scientific communi community with what became known as the uncertainty principle. It's the concept that we cannot be certain of the precise position or momentum of a quantum particle. That matter doesn't behave in consistent ways. Sometimes it behaves like a particle, other times it behaves like a wave. In short, he discovered we can't be as certain about the fundamental structures of our world as we once thought. And this principle of uncertainty, I think, has transcended the bonds of physics to influence a lot of other areas of our lives. Uncertainty produces anxiety. And indeed, we seem to be living in that age of anxiety. People are anxious, are worried about a lot of things. We might say, with good reason. Indeed, as we become knowledgeable about our world and its possibilities, also makes us aware that some of those possibilities are that bad things might happen. And in fact, the seeming randomness of some of these events leaves us feeling unmoored, uncertain, kind of buffeted about by the winds of chance, wondering when the next storm will appear on the horizon. Well, we also live in a world where we have more choices than ever before. And I should qualify that by saying those of us who are white, middle-class Americans do, because social location indeed does make a difference in how we hear these words. 
but having the ability to choose. It's a freedom that we treasure. Now, you're, you're probably not aware of this. Did you know that we're in an election cycle? <laughs> <laughs> We've been bombarded, haven't we? And that's one of our freedoms, that we have the opportunity to go to the polls in the fall to elect our next president. But choices bring possibilities, and we know that those possibilities could either be good or they could be bad. And so we cast our worries into the future. What if so-and-so is elected? What will that mean for our country? What will that mean for issues that we're passionate or care deeply about? What will it mean for our 401 case? Well, in the 1980s, Bobby McFerrin famously promoted a laid-back approach to life. Don't worry, be happy. Now, his catchy tune did lift one's mood, at least as long as the song was playing. But in fact, McFerrin's advice seems not only overly simplistic, but almost dangerously so. And I wonder when we consider Jesus' well-known instructions in Matthew 6, where he tells us, don't worry about it. And he uses lilies and he uses birds as examples. Do, does, do his words also seem overly simplistic for our complex modern world? And where does faith come into play? Is faith the absence of uncertainty? If so, then that ship has sailed a long time ago. Or is faith believing God in the midst of uncertainty? Well, perhaps a first misconception to tackle is how do we perceive worry itself? Is it inevitable? Is it simply a part of being human? And are there some who think worry actually can be a productive thing? It can keep us motivated, keep us pushing forward. There's a Harvard professor and preacher, Peter Gomes, who was invited to a girl's um, exclusive school, high school in Manhattan. And he was thinking about what should he preach, and so he chose to preach on this text. And he thought, boy, these anxious, overachieving girls really could resonate with this. And he felt like his sermon went pretty well, except for one parent who came up to him following the sermon. And he was furious. He said, it's nonsense. And Peter Gomes replied, well, I didn't say it. Jesus did. That didn't seem to dissuade him. He said, it's still nonsense because it was anxiety that got my daughter into this school. It was anxiety that kept her here. It's anxiety that will get her into Yale and that will keep her there. It's anxiety that will enable her to get a good job. You're selling nonsense. Well, this concerned father believed that worry or anxiety actually pushed his daughter to achieve and that securing a good job was what life was all about. Well, you may have noticed that when, where I begin the reading today in verse 25, it began with that word, therefore, which means it's following Jesus' instructions about another topic. And we might be surprised or might not be surprised to note that he's been talking about where do we place our treasures? Is it in heaven or is it in things on earth? In verse 24, Jesus has said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Interesting that he follows these words about money with an instruction about worry and anxiety. Perhaps it's because Jesus knew that money gives us a sense of security and might be seen as an antidote to worry. If only we have enough. We won't have to worry about college or getting a good job or having enough in retirement or how to take care of a loved one if they get sick. But there's an illusion here, isn't there? As many who find themselves in these situations have discovered that having money will cause the anxiety or worry to go away. And in fact, the opposite is often the case. Once we have money, we worry, are we, will we be able to keep it? 
What happens if we lose it? And how much is really enough? I had a friend who did a calculation one time, and he said he had determined that you need $2.5 million for retirement. Well, I'm nowhere near there. I don't know about you. <laughs> so what's Jesus doing here? Is he just concerned about our mental health, or is he pointing out that worry actually indicates an underlying spiritual condition? In short, is Jesus talking about worry because worry is sin? Now, we don't really think of it that way, do we? Jerry Bridges has suggested that it's one of those many sins that have become respectable. Hey, we all do it. We can't help it. It's not really that bad, is it? It's not one of the big ten, is it? Unless you consider that one of those ten says, you, ha you shall have no other gods before me. And as we think about the idols of our day, which aren't of wood and of stone, but are the things that we construct in our own minds, is there something that we are placing before our trust in God's providential care? Either our own meticulous preparation or a fatalistic belief in Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it probably will. So there's nothing I can do about it. Well, another reason we struggle to see worry as sin is because of our motivation. When we worry about family members or friends, it's because we care about them. What parent has not accepted that worry is just a part of what it means to be a parent? Or maybe we think about our own parents and how we measured how much they loved us by the fact that they waited up for us, didn't go to bed until we got home. How differently would we feel if our parent was sound asleep, seeming without a care as to where we were in the middle of the night? But worry is sin when we think about what it is that we're saying about God. Because worry implies a lack of trust. I'll give you an example. I worry sometimes when I'm riding in the car with my husband, Ralph. Now, I'm not worried about the car itself. I'm more worried about the decisions he's going to make in driving that car. <laughs> now, recently, we had a rather spirited conversation when I thought he was a little bit too close to a school bus in front of us, which indeed decided to stop and turn around without giving much notice and almost hit us on the way back. Now... My instructions about what he should have done were not very well received. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I actually think I'm a better driver than he is. <laughs> I would feel safer if I was driving the car, if I was in control. Now, isn't worry a little bit like that? We worry because we know we aren't driving the car. We aren't in control. So many things that happen in our lives. But what about those situations that, that we have some control over? Don't we worry about those too? When we know that we're making decisions that will affect other people that we care about or are responsible for, that could change the trajectory of our family or our company or, or of a life, we can become paralyzed, worrying about what decision to make, or once we've made a decision, worrying, did I make the right one? <clears throat> well, the list of things we can worry about seems endless, and so Jesus points out several of them when he tells us three times in our text for today, do not worry. And he begins by saying, do not worry about your life. And I think he's making a blanket statement that says worry affects every aspect of our being. It affects our, our mental, our physical, emotional, social, and spiritual state. We know this through a simple observation of the rise of anti-anxiety medications that are being prescribed. We recognize that mind, body, spirit, there's a connection there. And because worry is so pervasive and can touch on all these different areas, Jesus knows that combating it requ requires a radical reorientation of our approach to life. 
Now, ironically, worry is the byproduct of our own efforts of trying to relieve worry. Our solutions fail to satisfy. I wonder if that's not why Jesus begins in talking about such basic things, food and drink and clothing, and also why there is that petition in the Lord's Prayer that we pray each week. Give us this day our daily bread. Is Jesus saying, keep it simple, don't pile on more? Now, by mentioning these basic things, he's also acknowledging that these things are important. We can't live without these things. But then he asks, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And so he tells us to look at the birds of the air. He says they don't plant, they don't harvest, they don't rent storage units in which to store their stuff. He reminds his human observers they shouldn't get so caught up in the future that they're discontent with God is, what God is providing for the present. Now, Jesus isn't promoting idleness by any means, but he's encouraging us not to put all our security in what we accumulate. Isn't it an interesting cycle that the more we have, the more anxious we become, and the less we trust God for our future. Well, this leads to Jesus' second question. Are, are you not worth so much more than they? This is such a key question in this text. When we constantly are worrying about what's next or we're fearing the impact of certain scenarios, aren't we demonstrating that we really don't believe our worth to God? that we really misunderstand the nature of God's love for us. Jesus is saying, you are so worth it to God. So he's going to care about every concern that you have. Jesus' third question follows up to his second. Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to his or her life? And that word translated as hours, the word used for cubit, the length of from one's elbow to one's fingers. He's basically saying, by worrying, can you make yourself taller? I don't know about you, but I can remember those days in junior high of worrying about those things, wanting to be taller or wanting to grow. And of course, as we realize that, that fretting over those things did not change the outcome of them. Ironically, it does the reverse. <coughs> Worry doesn't lengthen our life, it shortens it. It doesn't make our lives better, just busier. Jesus' second example is his fourth question. Why do you worry about clothing? I wonder here if he's getting at that underlying thing that we worry about what others think of us. Clothes are symbolic of success, yet how many of us have clothes in our closets that haven't been worn in years? To this, he says, consider the lilies of the field. They're more beautiful than the richest person's apparel. He's reminding us that God's beauty exceeds anything that Ann Taylor Loft can offer. <laughs> Yet the flowers of the field have a short shelf life. And later, the remains will be used to stoke a furnace. So Jesus asks his final question, will he not clothe you much more than those magnificent flowers? O oh, you of little faith. If God colors the world with a gorgeous sunset or a multicolored rainbow, will he not color our lives with hues of hope and possibility that can never be erased? So Jesus says a second time, do not worry, for the Gentiles strive for these things. He's saying that the perspective, the mindset of our secular world is so different for, from what our perspective should be. That world is obsessed with being a go-getter, whereas we should be obsessed with being a God-seeker. And so that famous verse, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. The world says, seek security. 
Jesus says, seek me, and I will give you security. For a third time, he says, do not worry. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Don't live for that which may never come to pass to begin with. Focus on today, for tomorrow is in God's hands. Now, Jesus isn't offering us a a mantra to ward off any bad thing that might come our way. Instead, he's giving us a way to approach life and to respond to its challenges that is life-giving, not life-depleting. He's trying to reframe our understanding of our power and our control of our lives and the freedom we can find in recognizing I'm not in control, but my Heavenly Father is. It's been said that worry is a starting place, not a stopping place. We care about people. We care about concerns. But the deceptiveness of worry is that it keeps us in a cycle where we think we're moving somewhere, and yet we're just marching in place. When we use the things that we worry about as the content of our prayers, then we're doing something, both for ourselves for our relationship with God, and for those people whom we're concerned about. Well, there's an old Cherokee fable of a grandfather telling his grandson that within each person there are two wolves that are fighting for control. The one wolf is evil. It is anger, envy, regret, pride, worry. The other wolf is good. It is joy and peace, hope, serenity, and faith. So the boy thinks about what his grandfather has said, and he asks, Grandfather, which wolf will win? To which the grandfather replies, The one you feed. Worry is like a wolf inside our minds, devouring our peace, our joy, our sense of worth, our trust in God, our assurance that we are loved by him and cared for by him. Do we feed that wolf by staying in that cycle of worry? Or do we seek first God and his kingdom, trusting in his providential care that we can see all around us, even in birds and flowers? I wonder, how many of you would like to worry less? Then let's pray about it. Heavenly Father, you have gifted us with this life, with its choices, with its possibilities, with people that we care about and that we love, with things that are really important to us with concerns. And yet, Lord, you desire for us to not place ourselves in a position of of control over something that is not ours to control, but is in your providential care. Lord, I pray as we bring those things and those people to mind that we would be moved to offer them to you in prayer, for only you can carry them. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.